Action. G. A. B. C sharp. D. Um. Your turn. F sharp. Ooh. G sharp. A sharp. C sharp, D sharp, E sharp, F sharp. Hello, hello and, and also they've popped in. <laughs> they have. Hello and welcome to this um, curious piano teacher webinar. My name is Sharon Mark Taggart. And over here we have the lovely. Oh, I'm, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. sorry. I was so enjoying our game of ping pong scales. Uh, I'm even doing this in a sing songy way after having had this musical start. But welcome to this webinar. Um, it is lovely that we are doing a webinar. We've had some visitors recently. Um, so it's lovely that um, we are doing one. We're, we're really excited about this today. We're looking at scales and you're gonna be going away with um, at least 10 ideas. We've got a few other things that we were kind of excitedly talking about um, just before we got going there. Even just what you heard us coming in with, um, playing and doing a little bit of scale ping pong there. So can you please, as Juliet has just has just done, can you hop into the chat, uh, let us know whereabouts you are um, listening in from today. Um, Lee is asking, is there a handout uh, with the ideas? Yes, Lee, there is indeed. And we will be sending out uh, the PDF with all of the ideas summarized for you along with the webinar uh, replay. So we are the Curious Piano Teachers, as we've already said. Um, I'm Sally Cathcart, I'm based over here in the UK and I live up in the North Yorkshire Dales in Wensleydale. If you, if you like cheese, you might have heard of Wensleydale cheese. And um, it's a grey day outside, but it's great to be here with you all. And along with Sharon, the wonderful Sharon, um, we've been running the Curious County Teachers now. We're nearly coming up to our eighth birthday, believe it or not. Sharon, where are you based? So I am based, I'm just seeing here, Charlotte has hopped in saying Belfast, which, which is amazingly sunny right now. I am uh, about 30 minutes um, south of Belfast, close to the beautiful mountains of Mourne that sweep down to the sea. Um, and actually, Charlotte, um, we don't have sun at the minute, which I'm actually quite pleased about because when I get sun at this time of day, it actually, <laughs> it gets in the way <laughs> when I'm doing a webinar. So um, just wanna say a quick hello. We have callers, um, participants today from the USA, from England, um, from various places in Ireland um so yes let's see we have quite a few from dublin uh in terms of england we have let's see there's suffolk we have seanad from wales uh north somerset um and it, it's great to see some people from the united states um, and so so yeah. so hello to you're, Carol. Yeah. you're only four hours behind us at the moment i think so it's a good reasonable time of the day can we just say before we get going on the, the 10 scale ideas, if you've got a specific question about scales, we will probably have time to answer a few of those at the end. So if you want to pop that down into the chat and then I will go back later and find them and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, so we're gonna make a start though, I think with Sharon. Sharon, practice uh, scales number one, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. So we're going to be going through um, 10 practice strategies for you just now. Um, these can be used for really all levels of students, 
um, they're suitable for all scales. So whether you have um, an elementary level student doing playing a D major scale, or if you have a more advanced level student um, playing E flat melodic minor, they these ideas are suitable um, for all students, um, all scales. And actually, it's worth saying that for you as the teacher as well, they're also very, very suitable. In fact, um, as I get going with the first idea, I would love you to join in wherever you're sitting. Okay, and if there's people around you, it's going to make it very, very curious for them indeed. So the first idea is to move and say. Um, I mean, we know that repetition is at the heart of practice, um, but we know that we want to be able to repeat things in different ways. And that's why we don't want our students just playing ascending and descending scales and that's it. So <clears throat> this one is actually away from the piano. Um, it's move and say, and we are going to say aloud rhythmically. And I'm going to really stress that we're going to say aloud rhythmically um, the letter names for. Uh, and let's go with um, let's go with the F harmonic minor scale. So I'm going to give you a chance just to visualize yourself playing that for a moment. What are those letter names? F, G, A flat, okay? So take a moment, think through that scale, just one octave up and down, and then we're going to stand and sit as we say the scale. So are you ready? <clears throat> Here we go. F, G, a flat, B flat, C, D flat, E, F, E, D flat, C, B flat, A flat, G, and F. So you should be standing <laughs> for the end. <laughs> I love the way, Sally, that clearly Zoom is slightly, and we're kind of going up and down. <laughs> With the way the, the time delay is on Zoom, so good. So, um, I mean, what are the reasons for that? It, when you actually have to um, to spit out what the letters are, you really think about it. Yeah, sometimes um, our students can play scales. Um, they may just have played that scale successfully. But when you actually go and say okay rhythmically now tell me especially when it's going down and that's quite tricky the brain has to work quite hard um, to do that the other thing uh before i pass back over to sally for number two is to use a tennis ball i'm going to just stand over here a little bit and to set up a meter it could be a meter of two so pass catch pass catch or it could be pass catch pass A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, and so on. So, um, again, it's the idea of doing it rhythmically. It's keeping the brain moving. Okay. That's I like what I'm that saying. Idea. Yeah, I like that idea. I was thinking of a variation. I was thinking, um, how about, and this is what we do, you see, as, as piano teachers, all of you are out there, I'm sure, you hear something like that and you go, oh, oh, I could do this, I could do that. Absolutely, that's what you, that's what makes us really so creative. But I was thinking you could get them to um, be sitting on the white notes, not literally on the white piece, on your chair, and they could stand on the black one. I love that. I like that, yeah, I might try that. <laughs> Okay, um, so any other br bright ideas anybody has, do feel free to share them. So the second idea is using what we call plus one. Now, plus one is a practice strategy that we use very frequently um, here at the Curious Piano Teachers. My students, they just know what I mean. I say, uh, you know, let's do some plus one practice, or more likely they're able to say to me, I'll do some plus one this. So let's apply it to a scale. So what does it mean? It means each time you add one more note on. So I'm going to take the scale of B flat major with the left hand. 
a little bit on the tricky side and I've got several students learning this at the moment. So they start with a B flat and then they add on one more, plus one, and they add on one more. Now they can't start until they know where they're going for the next plus one. And of course this is one of the danger points. And if they don't get it right, they do it again. And then plus one more. Oh ho, over the danger point. And then we're adding on. And of course, in a very sneaky way, to practice the scale multiple times but their brain they are engaged and focused and there we go and then of course you've got to practice it coming down because remember that going up a scale the fingering feels very different with all our scales to coming down it's often coming down that they fall off a bit so I start with one note Each time the hand has to go into neutral and the whole hand comes with me so they don't leave fingers behind. Everything is lovely and closed and natural here. what they're practicing just that plus one going up and down for maybe two to three days by which point they will feel a lot more confident about their fingering it's not the only solution but it's a lot of fun and it gives them a specific strategy that they can just take home just use it all the time with them and they will just know i'm going to do plus one you don't have to explain yourself we like giving um, strategies names don't we we do, we do. <clears throat> and I think the fact that there are, that we as teachers have strategies, specific strategies for teaching scales, because otherwise um, students will go away and they will practice. You were mentioning about the descending scale part there. You know, they can get up, but coming down is, is, is an issue. And I think the other thing I love about that plus one strategy is when they put hands together, um, even just to kind of have that thought process of coordinating the um, the hands together and even going and doing it where you can literally go from the B to the C sharp and back down and then moving up and moving back down and then that tricky thing where you've got the right hand yeah is you're tucking in um, the thumb and it really does for for a student who struggles a lot with the fingering and coordinating the fingering you know when they can do one hand really well and the other hand but getting it together just kind of slows it down and helps them mm. helps them process mm. yeah and, and i think one of our jobs as, as as piano teachers to help our learners our students learn the job our job isn't to teach their our job is for them to learn um is to know how to break it down into those tiny details so that we appreciate how hard the coordination is there. And we can give them an engaging, fun, enjoyable strategy that they don't really realize they're learning. That's the secret really, I think. Right, back to you Sharon for number Okay, two. so um, that was plus one. So now onto the third strategy and this is called standing tonic setting dominant. So um, I'm going to do, and again, I'd invite you to do this with me. Um, we're going to do one octave of the D major scale. Uh, we're going to, again, so kind of similar to what I was doing earlier, we're going to call out the letter names, but we're going to stand on the tonic and then we're going to sit on the dominant. So if you kind of think about where we're at, and again, if I'm doing this with a student, I will get them to to identify, you know, if it's D major scale, what note is the tonic, what note is the dominant. And it's just a way of building in um, 
this this musical terminology that they need to know doesn't have to be the tonic and the dominant can be any scale degree that that you like so um standing on the tonic and then setting on the dominant still again saying these letter names uh, aloud and one other thing is if the student is finding it a bit tricky um because you don't want them going d e f sharp G, yeah, we want to have that sense of musical flow. So if they're struggling, keep it very, very slow. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D, C sharp, B, A, G, F sharp, E and D. Probably didn't feel that challenging, but if you speed it up, that is where you can build in the challenge. Or indeed, you could do something else. So, um, additionally, maybe clap on the median. So, let's just try that before we move on to the next idea. Okay, so uh, off we go. D, E, F sharp. G, A, B, C sharp, D, C sharp, B, A, G, F sharp, E, and D. <laughs> so there is quite a lot of laughter with it because it sometimes can feel like your brain's just slightly lagging behind the actions. Um, and again, why, why are we doing actions? It's because we know from, from, um, neurological research that again linking and getting movement into our piano lessons is so important singing and movement in our piano lessons and not just sitting and playing the piano all the time is really important Sally yeah and I think the the I love that game actually and I was thinking, okay, well, we could stamp on the tonic and we could tap on the dominant or tap our heads or something like that as well on the dominant um, the other reason why this you might think well why should we do this how is this helping well it's helping to focus their attention because just sitting like this and playing for 30 minutes i i challenge anybody to maintain their their attention adults as well for a full 30 minutes okay so the brain will wander off it just will that's what it does if you just repeat something it gets bored literally and it goes and thinks it finds something else to do up here so what we're trying to do here is we're, we're giving it a novelty we're, we're really come, coming and saying okay what if we try this possibility thinking what if and this is exploring the creative possibilities behind things which we know help us to engage and pay attention and we learn when we're paying attention we don't learn when we've switched off and going off and thinking of what we're having for tea tonight. So that's one of the really powerful reasons for including all this behind it. So, ah, uh, yeah, okay, um, on to the next one. Now, this is called fish and chips. You might know over here in the UK, if you're from the US, we like our fish and chips over here. And this one, I think, is replacing um, playing the scale and this time saying fish on the tonic and chips on the dominant note so i'm going to do that and then i'm going to talk a little bit i think about why we why we reckon the tonic and the dominant is so important to establish so i'm going to take um let's see it says i need to think ahead i think that's absolutely true i can see i'm going to get confused with this one well, let me give it a go so fish on the tonic Chips on the dominant. I'm having to think about it even now. Off I go. Fish. Chips. Fish. Chips. Fish. Chips. Fish. Chips. Did I get that well? Did I do well? Yeah. <laughs> and of course they can choose their own words. It doesn't have to be fish and chips. Can they think of, you know, something that goes together that they want to say? On, on Feel free to put into the chat now any suggestions you might have. Tom, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and again, it just puts a little new fresh light. I was really focusing then. It wasn't hard, but I was really focusing on what it was I was doing, because otherwise I know I would have said something else. So tonic and dominant, really important concepts for students to establish from the very start, I think. I call them home and away at the beginning. So we have a home note and we have an away note. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a minor or a major. I'm often, if they're playing something like that, a little pentachord, home, away, home. So they get that sense of the because, you know, Western classical music, it's fairly well embedded, you've got to admit. Um, so what that means is that when it comes to them learning pieces and we're asking them about what key it is in, they know where to look. They know they have to establish what the tonic is. And to do that, they look at the bottom. They look at the very last note at the bottom. That's where my students look first. And I have to say, I've only started to do this in the last few years and I cannot believe the difference it makes. Every time when I say, so what's, what's the key? They go to the bottom note, they say, I say, what's the tonic? They tell me the tonic is D. And then, and then I say, and what's the tonality? What's the tonality? And they will go and look at the key signature and they'll go, D major. And it's, it's just so simple when they know about this tonic and dominant. So fish and chips, tonic and dominant, love it. Sharon. Okay, so the next one, we're at number five now. <clears throat> is something we've called curious coordination um, and this is where you play a scale with one hand and you say the fingering that the other scale would be doing <clears throat> all i can say is you do really need to know your fingering for this and even as as we're going through those, these ideas even what sally was just doing with fish and chips if they don't know the notes if they don't know um, you know, in, in terms of the fingering, it really starts to get, to get very messy. And that's where you're going back to making sure that they can say aloud those letter names, that they absolutely know um, what, what the letters are. Indeed, that they understand, again, maybe perhaps through the plus one strategy that they can really, they've got those fingers and those hands coordinated. <clears throat> And if they're able to do all of these extra things, if they're, for example, um, playing scales in, a, in an exam setting, it really prepares them very well because they don't have to say fish and chips. Um, they don't have to play one hand and say the fingers of the, of the other. So here, here we go. I'm going to do, um, let me do C, do minor. We've been kind of living in major, but let's go for minor. Um, C, uh, harmonic minor. So I'm going to be playing the left hand and I'm going to be saying the fingers of the right hand. <clears throat> One, two, three. and just ask that lovely what what happened question we're into our questions here at the curious kind of teachers what happened and i had actually started to visualize if you had seen me i was actually i was looking where was i looking up to my right and i was seeing it in my mind's eye yeah and it kind of knocked me off but of course what you're wanting the student to do is not go and take a wobbly but to see okay can you really hang in there can you keep it um because we want to discourage our students as much as possible to stopping and going right the way back to the beginning again because that's a real cop out I, 
I think that's a really important point, actually, you know, to, to say mistakes are welcome. Mistakes are encouraged, actually. And in yeah. fact, with, with me, mistakes are kind of inevitable. Expected, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that's really quite hard, that is. And I think what, the other thing that we're, it's worth pointing out is what we're trying to do is get the fingering and the, the notes, literally, as I like to say, in the fingers, get, get your, your fingers thinking in that key. So it's an automated process. That's what we're looking for. You know, we have these three stages of learning, the cognitive, actually, which is where they're having to say things out loud, exactly what we're doing. And then you go to the associative. Well, by the time you're doing this and you're saying the um, fingering of the other hand, actually, you're well beyond the cognitive. You really quite at the top of the associative and you're going to the autumn where everything is automated. You know, the reason we can all play at scales like this and I can talk to you at the same time. I've done that, oh, I don't know how many thousands of times. It's automated. It's in my system. So all these ideas are helping to automate in fun and engaging ways, ideally, for our students. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought oh, it was my turn. The next one. Yeah, it's my turn. Okay. So this is called um, Minor minor major minor major yes okay so i'm going to start in a minor key and then after one octave i'm going to swap into a major key the tonic major and then i'm going to swap back to the minor and then back to the major so it's a really good one to do i think with your more advanced students in particular who can make who should be able to make that very quick cognitive switch yeah so i'm i'm going to go for something like i don't Oh, I'm going to go for something like G sharp minor harmonic. Okay, and uh, we'll just and we're going to use the long tonic as well. So you'll hear what I mean when I say the long tonic. Sally, I was thinking, okay, okay, so yes, G sharp minor, A flat major is also what you're kind of thinking. But there's nothing like a challenge, is there? Yeah. Okay. You know, why stay within your comfort zone actually when you can learn so much more? I could have played C major and C minor, but you know, why? That it's too. It, it, I, I like to challenge myself. So that one's a lot of fun, I think. The other thing I like to do, not so much the major and minor. But just to digress for a second, with minors in particular, I'll get my students to build up out of the three minor versions, the three flavours. So they might do the natural minor first. and then they add in a black note and then they add in another black note and then they cancel them all out. It's really important, I think, that you've shown that we're inventive with our scales. You know, those of you that are UK based, try not to just stick to what the exam boards say because they will say something different. And scales are not for exams. Scales are for learning the piano and becoming a better pianist. So. And to be honest, we're not even touching the ideas today of, um, you know, varying articulation or dynamics, no. but there's all of those possibilities as well. Mm, yeah, make them interesting. Make them interesting, I think. Okay, Sharon, over to you again. Okay, great. So, this next one is simply um, called intervals. So, the idea is that um, you create a short 
memorable um, rhythm pattern. Um, and then you play the scale in thirds, or it could be in fifths, or it could be in sixths uh, within that particular key. So for example, um, if you imagine, um, ta -ta 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 -ta. yeah, so I'm going to take that uh, as a rhythm pattern. And let's say I'm going to take um, a scale and I'm going to play, but just have a listen um, to, to what it is I'm, I'm doing here. talking about doing the thirds fingering um, that you would get with um, at a more advanced level. I'm just talking about a student who can play the D major scale um, from elementary level and figuring out what that looks like when when playing like that. So I'm hopping back and forward a couple of times because it gives the, ch the student a chance to kind of go, yes, it's D and F sharp. Yeah, and then playing it together. And then the next note of the scale is E. So in the D major scale, E up a third is going to be G, and then F sharp and A. And in terms of helping with key awareness, um, also just in, in terms of picking out then the intervals within that, um, I mean, if you're doing it with a fifth, you could get them to be playing, for example, student that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge but again getting an, an intermediate level student to, to experiment with something like that um sevenths so yeah I've, I've got to say i i do quite like um playing playing around with that um or getting mm -hmm. students should i say to play around with it because it really does help their awareness off the key whereas mm -hmm. sometimes they can rattle off a scale if like major but when they go to do something, you know, thinking within the key, they kind of, they only know it as the E flat major scale. Yeah, no, I, I really like that, Sharon. It would really help to in, embed that sense of key. And you, you're just using fingers one and three where you- I was just, I'm just seeing Anna's um, questions come there about fingering, yes. Um, this is this is not a fingering exercise, deliberately not fingering. It, it is so that you're actually within a scale, knowing from any note, you know, if it's an A, a third above that in D major, what note are you on? It's going to be a C sharp. Yeah. So just getting them to use a one, and I was just using one and a three, or a two and a four, or a three and a five again. Just, um, but the, the focus is not on the fingering. It is um, on on actually the. Um, the shapes and the patterns on the keyboard. Mm. And of course, at the higher level, you could actually do it for playing double thirds. You know, of course. Like B flat major with the correct finger. Like that idea, Ben, as well. Yeah, at the higher yep. levels so there, leading to. Yeah. And knowing yeah. the Yeah. Super idea. Super idea. Okay. Okay, so then. Um, yeah, getting your students to play a scale once they know it, once they know it, once they've gone through all these other things, once they know a scale, rather than rattle it off, get them to play it in a character or in a mood, or even in yeah, a mood that one of the pieces is in, for example. Um, so let's see, um, can you give me a character, Sharon? What shall I do it in the mood of? Um, I'm going to say Grumpy from the Seven Dwarfs. Grumpy from the Seven Dwarfs. I'm not sure how Grumpy moves, but let's see. Is that Grumpy enough for you or not? <laughs> I 
think so. I love your I loved your facial expression as well, Sally. Mm, and my whole body went down, didn't it? Is it? I could have it? Even, yeah. Yeah. I could have even done something like Love it. And do you know what our students do when they get into this? They come up with their own ideas. And again, that's what we want we want to encourage. I usually find they, they have far better ideas than I do. So I demonstrate something fairly pathetic, you know, and they go, oh, you could do like this. <laughs> I go, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and then I take it and use, use that with all my other students to inspire them. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, lovely idea. So, yeah, you could do grumpy. I, was, I got some of the, um, some of our mood cards out. We've got these different mood cards, so you could use those. Mm. Anxious, and have some anxious, or energetic. Oh, that was an upside down one. Not only you've got to play it energetically, you've got to read it upside down. Yeah, get them to play scales in these different characters or moods, or you know, find out what the what the hero of their latest book is that they're reading, and how would that you know? How would Harry Potter play it? You know, how would Hermione play? Hermione's bound to know all her fingerings, isn't she? Yeah, um, from from Harry Potter. Um, but how would Ron Weasley play? Oh, it'd be all over the place. Yeah, they love connecting it like that. They really do. Yeah. Sharon. Okay. So number nine. And this is um, what we call cross base finger. So I'm not going to literally do it. Um, I'm, say I'm going. I was, looking, I was looking forward to that, Sharon. Oh, were you? <laughs> so, um, okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to draw a cross thing, a cross face on my third finger. And really left enough room for the eyes and it doesn't really look that sad actually or that that cross yeah it looks a little bit more sad than cross anyway can you bring it a bit closer to the camera so people can see see how poor my artwork is <laughs> okay so take a finger okay so i've drawn a little cross face on my third finger and I'm going to play a scale. And every time I play with my third finger, I'm going to play it really okay. so. student's brain is having to do is to you know they're really con controlling uh what's happening within the tip of that third finger and because it's it's not a regular thing it is actually for some scales it's it's quite tricky to do the other thing that um i mean drawing a little cross face on the finger is one option the other thing i like and i don't have them and i i was almost going to the shop this morning buy some Harry Bow ring sweets but I thought okay I'm not just going to run up to the shop <laughs> it's a six mile trip just to get Harry Bow rings but I'm sure you know what I mean and there's a picture when in the in the pdf that we're, we're giving you of those little Harry Bow sweets their 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 rings um and to get a student to uh to put one of those on a particular finger and then they um you know they play each of those notes and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be angry it could be play that note lovingly or play that note um staccato i mean it could be literally a mixture of and um, in terms of the articulation so the student could be yeah so lots of other little things that you can do and again it will require at that stage for the student to know what they're doing because you're asking them to do something else and just use a bit of brain power um, beyond the basic notes and the fingers. And that, that could be a really useful approach if you've got a student who's got a finger that's it's weaker than the rest, the sound that's coming out, and that it could help to draw their attention to that particular finger, couldn't it? 
Or indeed, if you have got a student yeah. who the thumb. Thumpy thumb. Yep, thumpy thumb, and where you make it the very opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, really nice. So we're on to the last one, number 10. And this is again for your more um, intermediate, higher intermediate, I would say, and, and advanced students, um, because it's playing a scale and putting a cadence at the end of it. So a cadence, as you know, all phrases are marked, the end of a phrase is marked by a cadence, um, might be imperfect, probably will be perfect. There's something like 70% of all cadences are perfect. I don't know where I've made that figure up from, but it is a high proportion. So we're going to do a perfect cadence. I'm going to play a scale of F major and put at the end of it a perfect cadence. What does this require? It requires the student to know the scale of F major and it requires the student to know how to play the cadence of F major. So let's think we might work backwards and get them to actually play the cadence before they play the scale. Otherwise, they could get to the end and go, don't know, yeah? So, you know, F major, all right, so we'll be about here. I'm going to play two octaves for my impression. Um, so they're going to finish on an F, and probably they're going to be, just before it, there'll be the G. So what we need to hear, uh, having done that, we'll put the G at the top and go, need to work out how to play it. And of course, if they want to be really exotic and spicy, they can give us a five, seven. Okay. So you work out what the cadence, get them to work out the cadence, and then. Yeah. Or you could get them to do it again and do it in a different inversion. Or a different just, cadence, or, or a different just cadence. the descending scale. Just the descending scale, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's just again another way of just having to think a little bit more it's linking together musicianship keyboard harmony along with the scale play and getting your fingers to think in that particular key so a lot of fun with that one yeah and just as as the bonus one um in fact i think i have one and you have one, <laughs> to share have one yeah. <laughs> that we were talking about um and i think sally you had key signature cards Somewhere about there, hadn't you? Mm, um, do. How do we tend to ask our students scales? Um, you know, can you play me the scale of A flat major? Yeah, we tend to do that. Well, instead, or E flat minor. G flat. <laughs> um, we, we tend to ask it, let's see, there we go. So instead of saying, can you play me the scale of A flat major today? You just hold up a key signature card and go, play me the major scale. It's as simple as that. And they have got to recognize from the key signature where they're gonna begin. And it's amazing just how many students get completely, they can play the scale, but working it out to go, what's the one with the four flats in it? Yeah, so it's another good exercise that we're not just asking for A flat major scale, E flat minor scale. I, I think yeah, it's, it, what's really important is that we're linking everything in. We're not taking mm -hmm. scales as a technical exercise that just stand on their own and that don't have any relationship at all to actually the pieces they play or any theory that they might do. Everything is being linked up together and we're trying to get them to, to widen their, their knowledge and their understanding of keys and scales and cadences and key signatures and tonic and dominant it's all part of the same thing all absolutely part of the same thing if you establish the key signatures and the tonic and dominant stuff like that the scales will become easier because they're not struggling with the notes in quite the same way yeah so really really powerful stuff i think sally you had one to share mm, i thought of it i only thought of this this morning <laughs> and this is called i've called it 
four, three, no, sorry, four, let's try, three, two, one. Those of you that are a particular age will remember something of course, three, two, one. So this is, again, really, this is something I do quite a lot in pieces to break, really uh, examine coordination problems in particular. And you play each note four times. You know how hard it is to slow children and adults down sometimes. They, they just keep playing very, very fast all the time. You say, go slow, and they don't. So this slows them down. You take out the rhythm, and they're just going to play each note four times. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then playing it four times gives you a chance to think ahead. just go into two times. And then we're going to come down. We're going to go back to four times again. So again, coming down is, is harder or is, is different. And so on. And then we're going to go back to two. So what's that helping them to do is to really have the time it's sort of an enforced slowness, isn't it? To think about where that next finger is, I think. Yeah? So I'm, I'm quite excited by my new idea today. And it just shows where these little ideas come from when you're thinking about a subject um, like scales, which we have been today and yesterday, haven't we, shall we? Um, you suddenly go, ooh, ooh, could do this, could do that, could do the other. So I think that is probably all we have got for everybody, but we'd love to hear any questions that you have um, about anything we've done today or any particular problems that you have in your teaching of scales and um, where and if we can possibly help. And Sharon, I think in, I'll just collect those together because I know you've got something to share with people as well, haven't you? I love all these comments that we've got um, coming down here. I think I saw a question about the the, the technical names, um, as in, uh, yes, as in what's the medium. So, yeah, the degrees of the scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all have different technical names. There's an awful lot of logic behind, behind them when you look into them. So, you know, tonic, medium, the third, the dominant, it's to do with the dominance of it. And then we have the supertonic, yeah, so it's above. Did you know the flattened seventh down here is actually the subtonic? The sharpened seventh is the leading note. And then, of course, under the, we've got the subdominant, but really the subdominant is five down from the tonic. So we have the dominant up five, we have the subdominant, which is down five. So, well worth looking into. We've actually got, I got really nerdy about this in one of our curiosity boxes where we were looking at theory, I think. So you can yeah. find a whole load of stuff in there. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so go... as you do that, Sally, I am just going to um, go in here and share. Okay, while you do that, I'm just going to go back to one more question, which was Juliet, I think, asking about the submedian. So think of this word sub, Juliet. And um, here we have tonic, mediant, dominant, mediant there, yeah, in the middle. And then if we think of the sub-mediant, that is going down to the, do to the sub-dominant, yeah? So you've got tonic, sub-mediant, sub-dominant. So think of it, think of it out from the tonic, going up five and going down five. Yeah, mediant, sub-mediant. Dominant, subdominant. Supertonic, subtonic or leading note. Uh, yeah? But there's plenty of stuff about it in a curiosity box. As I say, I got very, um, very nerdy about this at one point. Sharon. Great, thank you, Sally. Okay, I know that we do have uh, members on this call today. But in case you are not yet a member of the community of the Curious Piano Teachers, I'm just going to very, very briefly, I'm not going to show you very much because um, you can um, 
hop in and get a free trial and explore it all for yourself. Uh, I'm going to put uh, a link in the chat in just a moment. But we have um, in our PED membership site, which we refer to as the community, because it is a wonderful community of uh, piano teachers from all around the world, where together we share uh, and we learn. We share and we learn together. So um, I'm just going to click on on one of these boxes. So basically, um, we have now, I think, Sally, over 80 curiosity boxes. Um, now, when you click on um, a topic that you might be interested in, um, for example, this is a toolkit for teaching grade one piano. Um, you can see that you get an overview of what it contains. Um, you click on and you get um, videos. And then there are downloadable resources as well. As I say, I'm not going to detail too much more about that because if you're not yet a member, you can get a free one month trial. You can get in and you can explore. Uh, we also, um, I should say, this is a new website, a brand new website that we uh, launched last autumn, um, last fall. And we, one of the one of the key things is that we have this search facility. So whatever it is you are wanting, you're curious about, or needing to know about for your lessons that day, um, you pop into the search and. Um, then a range of stuff will come up that will um, help and, and guide you. So I am going to pop the link to um, that free trial in the chat in just a second. I also want to say that if you do not get our newsletter, please go and sign up for our newsletter. Um, we've had our newsletters all rebranded uh, since the beginning of the year and there our community manager packs them full of lots of amazing stuff plus we are having a free webinar with um karen marshall next tuesday monday today's tuesday yeah, yeah. <laughs> next monday um and after the members in the community our mailing list to that for that newsletter you are the next people to know about um, all of our free webinars so um, i'm going to pop those going to go grab those links sally i'm going to pass over to you just while i go and get those yeah that's 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 all great um so thank you i'm going to say to everybody for actually coming along and being part of this uh fun we've we've enjoyed ourselves anyhow um fun webinar and um from wherever you are that you've been watching as sharon said we'll be back next monday and we've got a, a a very special guest karen marshall and she's going to be launching her new book of complete sonity sonatas and i know she's very excited to be coming and doing that if you are haven't signed up yet to our curiosity zone then do because you get a uh, first-hand news about everything that we've got going on and we have got quite a lot planned actually over the next few months so you do want to keep in touch with us about that so there's the newsletter that you can see there and um, there is also the the link for the free trial i think we've we've just about done we're all scaled up scaled out it's great to hear so many people say they're going to go and try that in their in their teaching this week absolutely i'm going to go and try that as well and um, lots of those ideas as well and i'm actually i saw this <laughs> this is this is my final starter for 10 really um because i teach online all my students are online really and um, I, I have one one young man in particular who can play scales, but he can't do that. He doesn't do the right fingering. And you know what kids are like? They just blag it, don't they? They just pretend they've got it. So I have a scale honker now. <laughs> and every time I see the fingering go wrong, it goes, <coughs> and he knows he has to start again. And again, it's just a lot of fun. And it's a bit of a, a silly way of telling him, uh, you better so 
be creative with your scales, with your teaching. I love that. And I'm guessing that the honk is all he gets. In other words, you figure out yeah. what it is you need to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> love it. Love it. Curious as ever. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today. I know that some of you are heading off to teach. Uh, a reminder that uh, later on today, um, probably this evening, because I'm heading out to teach just now, uh, but you will get an email from us. There will be the replay. And with all of those ideas that we have been sharing with you, those 10 ideas, we've got a gorgeous PDF um, designed by Una, our lovely graphic designer. Um, so we're going to be sharing that with you as well so that you've got a, a summary cheat sheet for those ideas. And yeah, we hope you have lots of fun with them in your studio. And remember to try them out in yourself as well. Yeah. So thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you soon. Stay curious. Bye. Bye-bye.